be. Sorry about the delay. We've had uh, a few technical glitches, um, mainly my fault, I'm afraid. So I take entire responsibility for um, for um, the delays on this. My name's Mark Acton, and um, I've been asked to chair a somewhat combative debate um, between two parties, uh, really to explore the, the ongoing discussion between those in the immersion liquid cooling camp and those more on the traditional air side cooling for data centers. So we've had a lot of heated debates on this. Um, obviously, we, we, we are having very much um, an emergence of liquid cooling. We have a very traditional um, approach, typically in data centers. Sets of people together. Uh, we bring, let's call them competence, um, together to have this debate so that we can settle once and for all um, whether we are going to have a complete takeover by liquid immersion cooling guys at data centres or whether the air side is going to prevail. Um, on that note, I'm going to allow the two competents to introduce each other, um, to put forward their, their cases, and, um, and we'll engage in an ongoing debate. And again, apologies for the slow start on this. So, um, Rolf from Asperitas, can you introduce yourself, your company, and can you possibly give us a, a bit of an idea as to why uh, you think there are problems or, or deficiencies uh, on the traditional air-cooled um, uh, technologies that we've used in data centers in the past? Sure, thanks, Mark. Um, yes, so my name is Rolf Brink. I'm a founder and CEO of Asperitas. Um, and Asperitas is an immersion cooling company. We've developed products for the immersion industry. Um, uh, and we focus a lot on uh, sustainability uh, and efficiency of uh, IT platforms. Uh, I'm also leading the immersion work stream uh, within Open Compute, within the ACS group, the Advanced Cooling Solutions group. Uh, to help the industry get to a next level as well. So, um, in response to the question that you're asking, um, I, th I think, uh, uh, I believe that immersion is the most efficient uh, method of IT platform cooling uh, and maintaining uh, proper temperatures and, and good modes of operation. Uh, while addressing sustainability goals, but also to achieve certain densities that are becoming more and more difficult with air cooling. Okay, thanks, Rolf. Thanks very much. And in the other corner, uh, I'd like to introduce Matt, um, who is going to, from Airdale, who's going to more the traditional side of the cooling um, solution. Uh, off you go, Matt. Cheers, Mark. So, uh, Matt Evans, um, thanks for the introduction, Mark. Um, I work for Aida International Air Conditioning. Um, we are um, the, the largest UK manufacturer of uh, air conditioning equipment, predominantly for data centre applications. Um, and as you probably have guessed from uh, the title of this debate, that we are probably predominantly focused on air cooling um, methods uh, of cooling data centres. Um, in terms of the the opening gambit, if you like, is is there an issue with air cooling or you know um, that sort of ilk? Um, it's an interesting it's an interesting fact that the the entirety of the, the data center landscape, um, bar two examples which Rolf could probably dig out, being Alibaba and, and Doug, um, are still using air cooling, and that's um, that's not a coincidence. Um, it's by far the the most straightforward, I guess, is the, is the opening point, um, and you know. Uh, People will probably be expecting Rolf and I to trade blows um, in this, which I'm sure we will do back and forth. But you know, it's not so much um, you know one's better than the other um, outright. You know, there are um, there are points where where they kind of meet together, and um, I think it's going to be quite interesting hearing uh, Rolf and I sort of debate on that. Don't, don't roll over and die just yet, Matt. Please, no. <laughs> <laughs> so. So thank, thanks both of you for the introductions, and thanks both of you for um, for, for, for pulling this together and being. I, I'm going to present a motion now, which is hopefully going to uh, kickstart us. And so the motion that I'm going to put forward, uh, and that uh, each of you will either defend or, or, or obviously push back against, um, is, is is immersion cooling more energy efficient? And will therefore, over, will it therefore overtake air-based systems as a preferred method of cooling in large data centers by, let's say, 2030? So again, 
I'll, I'll, I made a number of statements there. Commercial cooling is more efficient. It will overtake air-based systems potentially as the preferred cooling method by 2030. So um, let's, let's kick things off with that. Um, it's a fairly contentious point. Rolf, uh, can you defend that motion, please? Yes, of course I can. So when you're talking about liquid cooling, uh, in this case specifically immersion cooling, uh, immersion cooling is a holistic way to dealing with the thermal challenges of IT equipment because the entire system is immersed in liquid. There is no overhead energy for air cooling anymore. Uh, so we're getting rid of fans uh, and uh, the, the thermal environment allows us to work with much higher ambient temperatures uh, and a combination of free cooling, which means that Immersion cooling address uh, creates an environment without any uh, significant overhead uh, in terms of energy use anymore. So that's definitely a key aspect for immersion cooling being the most efficient method. Okay, and then, then to Matt. So, so Rolf, Rolf made his case to, to to defend the motion. How about yourself? What, do you think liquid cooling will ever actually take over? Do you think it's going to be the primary cooling method in data centres? And, and you know, maybe talk about both the build phase in terms of what we're building in the future, but also the use phase. You know, what are we going to be building and, and, and both building and using uh, as we move forward? Um, will it be air? Will it be liquid? Well, I mean, it, I'd be foolish to sort of sit here and start saying that immersion cooling isn't, on paper at least, more efficient. You know, as Rolf says, the overhead is gone in some respects. Um, however, to say that uh, it's more efficient in sort of a um, in an attempt to uh, make it out as a big deal, I, I think that's not really the case these days. Um, if you look at I know PUE uh, is a is not a particularly fantastic metric these days of doing it. Uh, and before you turn around and say PUE is irrelevant, um, I mean in terms of overall energy uh, input. The um, you know if you look at um, if you look at the the, the current generation um, of not so much hyperscale because that's a slightly different um, kettle of fish, but if you look at large colo environments which are air cooled. Um, some of the, you know, some of the big operators now are pushing up the supplier temperatures to a point where uh, we're seeing supplier temperatures above 30 degrees. So just as an example of a project, we're running sort of 32 to 33 supplier, running water at 2933. Um, when you start looking at that and typical ambience within Europe and probably most of the rest of the world, um, you know, you're not really using much mechanical power to do that. And if you compare that to an immersion system, the only difference is that you have fan power, whereas the immersion system has an internal pump. So with it comes on to another point of failure domain. So when you consider the air cooling system is typically running on an N plus X redundancy perspective, um, your air cooled system is actually benefiting massively from running in nominal operation at a you know reduced speed. So you know through the affinity laws, through the use of EC motors, variable speed drives, you know your your sort of overall uh, efficiencies are almost identical you you're within maybe one to two percent of of an immersion facility um and it also gives you a lot more flexibility so i i don't you know like i said at the start i'd, I'd be daft to sort of say that you know that's not the case immersion isn't more efficient but in reality you know not without looking at the drawbacks of either scenario or purely on efficiency alone i don't think it's a particularly solid selling point so, so to your point, there's, there's no compelling case on efficiency. So may, maybe there's, there's another area, Rolf. I mean, is, is this all about equipment density potentially? Uh, you know, are, are, are we able to um, achieve cooling with, with much higher equipment densities than, than possibly air cooling? Is that somewhere you you potentially go? Uh, well, I, 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 for first, I, I would like to respond to the <laughs> to the efficiency <laughs> remarks. <laughs> <laughs> because when, when you're taking 32 degrees as a baseline, I mean, uh, come on, uh, we use we deploy we're working with immersion systems that are being caught with 50 uh, instead of 32. I mean, th there is a massive, massive difference when it, when you're talking about efficiencies of air and that it can be achieved with liquid. So uh, with 32 degrees C, you can't run, you can't build a data center without chillers. Uh, because there's days in the year, there's weeks in the year. Nowadays, it's got only going to increase to even months per year, uh, where you're going to be running at temperatures that are way above those 32 degree uh, limits, right? So you're going to need some chiller environment to get below that point. Um, and this is where I think where immersion can uh, uh, can have conversations about climate independence and, and and geographic independence, where you don't need to build your facility around the around the Arctic Circle. 
just to make sure you can supply 32 degrees C year round, right? So this is where, this is a massive, massive difference between the efficiency remark. Um, uh, but also your, the, the topic that you're opening, Mark, I think that's, that's a very good point uh, as well when it comes to densities and uh, chip developments. I mean, uh, chips nowadays are only going to get higher in energy use and therefore also with their thermal properties. Uh, at, to the to the level where air cooling is going to be in serious trouble. Um, simply put, the, the the highest rated CPUs are going to be standard equipped uh, equipped with uh, liquid cooling uh, as by default. That's what we're talking about. Uh, uh, cold cold plate uh, and a lot of these technologies will be implemented in immersion as well. Um, simply because even with cold plate. Um, not all the energy is being rejected from the system. So if you're just focusing on efficiencies, uh, that's where immersion is, key, is a key element. And the density increase that you can deal with simply due to the uh, thermal properties of, of liquid usage for cooling, um, that allows you to unlock some uh, potential which is otherwise very difficult to do with pure air. Okay, that's, that's fair enough. Um, so to, to give Matt the chance to reply to that, so equipment density. So, uh, you, you know, I think there's, there's, there's probably a little bit of confusion in the industry that air can only serve, uh, you know, a certain equipment density, let's say, you know, maximum of 10, 10 kilowatts of cabinets or something of that nature. What's, what's the reality of that? How far can air go? I mean, you know, and where maybe is the point at which immersion comes in and, and, and uh, takes over? Uh, what do you say to that, Matt? Well, I think looking uh, looking at density as being a limiting factor of air uh, is an easy sort of target. But let's be fair, um, how many years have we been doing now where people are starting to go on about, oh, rack densities are increasing, you know, we're going to do a, a billion watts a rack or whatever. And it's been, you know, I reckon large colo in even the most high density, large scale applications is probably no higher than 15 to 20 kilowatt a rack. And you know, that, that's not really a, an issue at all. Um, I get where Rob's going with the fact that, you know, TDPs on chips, you know, a lot of the, um, the latest Intel stuff is, is going above 500 watts um, per, you know, per individual chip. Um, some of the graphics cards uh, are doing similar. But the thing is, yes, it is easier to cool them from an immersion perspective, but it's not a requirement. Density is not a limiting factor with air. Um, it's especially not in the current um, the current circumstances. And, and definitely, if you talk about the, the top of this debate sort of being 2030, um, yeah, let, let's be real about it. We're, we're not going to be seeing densities that are uh, sufficient enough to, to mandate, uh, in the general term at least, not outside of supercomputers, that require uh, immersion cooling. So I don't think density is another point that the, the immersion crowd has got it on. And I think, uh, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, Rolf, but if you look at your um, sort of marketing material in terms of your AIC 24, you've got a 24U there that's um, the bottom end you advertise is 25 kilowatts. Um, where are you going to find 24, 24 or 25 kilowatts in 24U? Uh, it doesn't exist. So it's almost like you're, uh, you know, you've got a great solution to a problem that doesn't actually exist uh, in many respects. Um, I think it will exist, but not not for a while. Certainly not by 2030. Oh, I'd like to, I'd like to I'd like to go ahead first in that one <laughs> because the, because the chassis that we're working with currently we're talking about two kilowatts per chassis uh, uh, so so we're all, we're doubling uh, we're, we're working with double that footprint so um, th th there is uh, a huge market that is not even considering air cooling anymore. Uh, that, 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 that you're not dealing with because these type of platforms uh, are just not feasible for air. Uh, and that's that's that, those platforms are a big deal. We're talking about AI platforms. We're talking about uh, uh, even regular compute. If, if you look at a standard Dell server today, the minimum spec CPU you can get is 180 watts, uh, and that's the, that's that's the bottom side. And everything else is only going up. So having a dual CPU blade uh, with one of these, uh, I think it's, I think it's the most sold Dell system uh, that's chassis with four blades. You're already talking about one and a half, two kilowatts, and two U. Uh, and filling up a rack with that, I mean, that's going to cause some challenges, right? So that, 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 that's a normal mainstream platform already. Yeah, but if you, let's take that example and let, let's, you said one and a half, one to one and a half kilowatts per TU. Let's, let's, let's amp it up, let's say one kilowatt per U. So let's take a 42 U rack and rack it like top to bottom, one kilowatt per U. 42 kilowatts is still not a problem with air. 
and you're going to have to use more footprints up to to put your horizontal um, AIC immersion cooling tank to be able to do that. So again, I still don't really see where the benefit is. I'm a bit lost with it, you know. Um. So here's where the benefit is: with uh, with air cooling, you have to stretch the capabilities of technology of the cooling installation, of airflow and the air speeds that you need to maintain. Uh, combine it with vibrations that you're going to encounter, and we're talking about uh, what well, we're actually cooling that without any moving parts at all. All right, uh, so no airflow space uh, required, no additional spacing to allow that cooling to happen. It's passively done, uh, uh, and it's a, it's a starting point, right? So uh, we only can go can go up. I'll, I'll I'll take that. You can only go up, yeah. When when the requirement. <laughs> right. So. knows really you know if you ask anybody what what the cost of a data center is they ask how many megawatts and they'll give you a, a rough sum depending on where it is the world and what, what it's going to cost to to install you know it's a fairly known quantity um you know with with you know rough numbers around it but um it's obviously going to be cheaper at the moment to uh, to actually install an air cooling system uh, and as i was saying earlier i don't think there's that much in it in terms of opex in terms of all the other factors as well just to touch on that um, I think the resilience is an easier one to prove as well with an air cooling system. Um, in Rolf, you know, in Rolf's defence, to sort of, you know, I don't want to make this completely me trying to uh, beat Rolf up because that's not the point. Hey, come on, that's the, that's the point of this debate, right? Oh, okay, well, but <laughs> what I was going to say is, you know, every single new solution has um, a, a challenge, and you know, the immersion cooling obviously has a lot of challenges. That's why we're having this talk. But on the cost side of it, um, and Rolf will probably, you know, allude to the same. It's going to cost you more to install an immersion-based system today, even though it is a more simplistic, in principle, um, you know, solution. However, um, as has been shown, you know, in in every industry and every product, um, as as adoption becomes uh, greater and greater, the cost of ownership uh, or the cost of purchase, at least, your capex reduces. So, you know, as Rolf was saying, as densities do increase and there is an actual mandatory requirement for some of your data center to be uh, immersion or liquid cooled, um, there, there's, you know, there's going to be a requirement for, for the immersion, sorry, someone's just walked in, um, and the cost of it's going to drop. So, you know, there will be a point where there will be a, uh, you know, six of one afters of another in terms of what the, the overall cost of installation is going to be. Yeah, so, so when you're talking about cost in the facility, especially uh, today, uh, when you don't have so many facilities that are actually built and designed for pure liquid cooling, uh, you're always talking about brownfield, uh, which means that there usually is an existing infrastructure that is designed for air cooling, and adding any kind of liquid cooling to that to a facility like that is going to be an additional cost because you won't be able to benefit from the full cost savings of liquid cooling. So you're actually effectively maintaining a dual infrastructure for two purposes. Um, but what, that, that changes radically already today when you can, uh, in greenfield situations, where you can design for purpose. Right? So if, uh, and this is also a key element uh, in uh, in, in weighing in immersion or any kind of liquid cooling technology, to make a to make an effective business case, um, we're just not talking about 100% migration to immersion. That that's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, there's always going to be components which are not necessarily suitable or uh, preferably uh, not immersed in that sense, simply because it doesn't make any sense because we're talking about storage platforms or uh, or, or switching platforms, network platforms with a lot of connectivity uh, from a practical and an energetic point of view, it doesn't make sense to put it in immersion. But there are other liquid technologies that are suited for that purpose, which can be combined with liquid cooling that also result in air cooling, but have liquid cooling in the, in the basis, things like radar coolers and cold plate. And it's, it's about mixing those up, which allows you to move away from the core uh, being air cooling 
and, tr and make that transition towards liquid cooling and allows you to reap the benefits of liquid cooling infrastructures. I mean, you, you know, clearly in with immersion cooling, you're, you're going to be dependent on, on let's say, chillers or, or chill circuits or, or something for heat rejection. You know, you've got to reject the heat somehow. Yes, that's correct. So that heat is accumulated uh, in a water circuit, and the water circuit needs to reject the heat somewhere. Now, one of the things that is, uh, and that actually uh, gets back to that efficiency conversation as well. Uh, when we're talking about the 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 the, uh, the absolute temperatures that can come out of these li these liquid cooling systems. Um, you're talking about temperatures that are at the level where there might actually be a value for reuse. So I know that this is a thing that's most predominantly present in Europe, uh, less so in the US. Um, but there is a value associated with heat. And uh, being able to uh, upgrade that heat or even, uh, even either by the cooling installations or the IT equipment directly or by other means, things like heat pumps, uh, which are essentially the same things as chillers, just they work the other way around, right? So it's um, <laughs> a bit crude to say that. Of course, I'll probably get some some bad emails on that on that statement. But still, uh, technology-wise, it's not so so different from cooling stations. So when you are an air company and you're dealing with installations that are focused on dealing with thermals in facilities like this, uh, there is still a lot of value add. To be involved in that in that game. I guess you know um, to, to, to match on this one. I guess you know heat, heat recovery and, and using it for whatever purpose is it's entirely dependent on finding customers reasonably close to the data center, um, so you can actually make use of that way. So you know it's only valuable if it's, if you've actually got a customer for it or a use for it. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I guess I'll just jump in on that one, I think. Um, no, I, I agree completely with what Rob's saying. And, what, and to your point, Mark, um, you know, there, there has to be a need for it. Um, just thinking of the, the large scale installations, if you were to consider a, you know, a fairly typical solution or facility these days of 30 to 40 megawatts, um, if you've got heat reuse available, uh, you still need to, to have a, uh, you know, a, there's a CapEx issue with doing the, the initial installation of that. But also in the fact that you need to duplicate because you're not always going to be able to get rid of some of the heat all of the heat you know um so you're going to have to double up on that so you know um it does it does become an issue because then space comes into it as well so um just on the topic of the reuse not not really the the air versus immersion side we have the same stuff uh, that, or the same issue should we say with um with all of our facilities you know in amsterdam heat reuse is now a a mandatory requirement to have built into the design um, but what you'll actually see is that it's built into the design, but it's never really intended to be used. And I think that's actually quite a big industry challenge at the moment to actually work out how these um, these systems are actually integrated. So immersion being um, operating at temperatures that are already conducive to, to doing that um, is a big advantage. But again, the whole 2030 thing, I think we're miles away from seeing any um, sort of traction in terms of deploying this en masse um, and, and really to, to any successful use case i think it's all really been done so far just as a sort of display of proof of concept rather than an actual credible uh, money making which is probably the key thing um you know venture uh, this actually reminds me to a point in time uh, you might remember that i think it was somewhere in and 1990s uh when microsoft said something about the internet and email not getting anywhere why would anybody you start using email systems uh, if we all got faxes and 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 i think it was only one or two years later after they dropped out of the, in, the first internet explorer versions when uh, uh when netscape and all the others started kicking off and the internet started to become real uh, this is the same stage that we're in in this industry today right so everywhere across europe these mandates are being put in there's a reason for it there is a delay for that, what the utility industry needs to see first is that, that data centers are prepared for it. And as, as soon as they are, the heat grids are going to be put in place. And the district planning is already, uh, has already been done in most areas across Europe. Right? So it takes a couple more years to actually build that up. But right now, what we're seeing is uh, we're 
at that tipping point and we're in that overlapping phase of these two of a very traditional way of looking at data center facilities and uh, being uh, becoming a, a new industry standard or a new way of doing things and uh, and there is more than the data center industry being involved in this it's it's utilities it's governments and that push is not something that we can that anybody can hold off unless uh, there is some radical developments on chips uh, on on IT systems design, which is not uh, on, which is not yet on the horizon uh, to pop up anytime soon. You're touching on a point which I'm, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but it's it's a fair. But if we're talking about true energy efficiency in the data center, we've actually got to include the IT stack, not just the cooling and power provision. Um, it's got to go a lot further than that. You're absolutely right. But um, but going back to the the point, it, it's. You know, I'm getting a sense that actually you're you're probably more in agreement, um, sadly, rather than combative. It seems like actually, uh, you know, to recover that heat, to actually reject the heat, you know, there is a requirement to use more traditional um, cooling technology, chill and it might be, or, or, or heat pumps, etc., going beyond just the immersion side. Would that be fair, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. Um... You know, even if you you consider the emerging stuff being at 50 degrees, that's at source. By the time it gets anywhere, it's going to have to be um, tempered or whatever you want to call it to you know heat pump, put through a heat pump and then uh, then boost it in temperature for it to actually be used in a, in a credible way. Uh, unless it's sort of like next door, and you know you're going to have losses all the way down the line. Um, but to to pick up on a point that Rolf was saying, you know, being at the start of a journey here, um, the the key thing with data centers these days on large scale deployment, which is obviously where the immersion market needs or is wanting to go, is that, you know, CapEx is king in today's day and age. You know, all the REITs are, are focusing on CapEx massively and OPEX is almost, you know, not sadly, but it, it, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a shame that OPEX has kind of gone secondary. But CapEx is king um, when you start trying to factor in all these things that, you know, it's more expensive to install. Um, you can do the heat reuse, but it's going to cost you a load more on it as well. Um, it doesn't really bode well in terms of, you know, a short term or even a medium term success story there. I think it's something like Rolf was saying, unless something drastic happens uh, in terms of mandating requirement, um, we're not really going to get this sort of moving very quickly. Well, here's the thing. Uh, you keep pressing on KPEX uh, being higher. Uh, it's just not the case. Uh, if you compare uh, any kind of immersion or liquid cooling solution to a traditional rack, which is worth about 700 quid, um, uh, that's not, that is not how to compare a liquid cooling solution to something that is being done right now. The, comparison, the only fair comparison to make is to make that comparison for the entire facility. And that's where the cost effectiveness is greatly increased because you don't, install chillers you don't install uh, all the air cooling equipment to transport and move around immense quantities of air where you can suffice with a simple pumped uh, water circuit uh, and this is where the capex come from and uh, this is also one of the more complex issues with uh, one of the more complex hurdles actually uh, when it comes to adoption of liquid cooling it's it's actually comparable to the uh, uh, to, to the past 10 years uh, and a discussion around electric cars uh, it takes a long time before people get adjusted to the fact that you're not stopping at a gas station anymore and people are worried about well uh, how about my mother's can i make it to my work if there is no gas station for me to plug my electric car into well the whole, everything changes because you're charging at home and that means every time you step into your car it's fully fueled and, and these kind of differences these fundamental differences are hard to imagine for people that or for an industry that is so stuck in a way of doing things the fact that the capex and opex are both lower uh, should actually be arguments for a drastic acceleration of technology but that doesn't seem uh, uh, seem to be happening at a large scale simply because there seems to be a lot of fear for change. You know, one of the things that we end up in now 
is a fundamental resistance against the principle of change, it seems. I disagree uh, on a lot of that, actually. Uh, I think that the only point where you can actually argue that it's it's almost cheaper or is cheaper to uh, do an immersion-based solution on a, on a whole sort of facility scale is only when density becomes sufficient enough um, to, to actually mandate it because, you know, pound per kilowatt, it's going it, to, air cooling is cheap um, and it will always be a lot cheaper, um, irrespective of whether you get wide scale adoption of immersion cooling, um, it's still going to be cheaper. I can't see how it, it wouldn't be. Um, you know, you're doing in a crack unit that's, you know, let's call it three, three and a half meters wide, um, you're doing like 350 kilowatts worth of cooling um, and it costs, you know, hardly anything. Um, relatively compared to an immersion tank that might cost the same as, as that thing and doing 50 kilowatt. So unless you actually require that density to be there because the IT power and the compute is so high, then, you know, I, I honestly think that it's almost trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. You know, we're, we're not trying to be the Apple and the Steve Jobs of saying, you know, you, you need a phone that doesn't ring people. You need a phone that does all these apps and it does all this other great stuff and you can do the internet with it and all the rest of it. You know, we're, we're not inventing the requirement here. The IT manufacturers invent the requirement or they mandate the requirement. And then we just solve the solution. So, uh, again, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to appear as if I'm trying to be ultra negative on the immersion camp because I'm not. I think it's fantastic. But I do honestly think that it's a, uh, a solution that's trying to be shoehorned in uh, to a problem that doesn't necessarily exist, at least not in the wide scale um, parts of our industry. You know, for generic use, colocation type use, relatively below the air, air still has a place, but then maybe at the higher densities in, in where space maybe is more of a premium, um, then, you know, immersion cooling has a, has a niche solution or, or a solution generally. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you've got a couple of high density racks, or high density pieces of equipment and immersion makes it a very easy sort of use case to just drop in because you know not only can it operate on high temperatures it can operate on sort of standard conventional chilled water temperatures as well so it's an easy solution to just drop in very similar to reared or heat exchangers as well and potentially in rack solutions um it's a really really nice solution um i think one of the areas that's very interesting at the moment in the industry is sort of edge or whatever anybody wants to describe as edge but my idea in my head is sort of, you know, distributed compute um, in containers or, um, you know, cabins or whatever you want, you want just distributed around where, you know, uh, the OPEX side of it is more aligned around maintenance. And if you look at immersion based solutions for that market, that is a very different story uh, completely, because not only can you do high density, you can do very low maintenance. And that I see as being one of the. Uh, you know, if we were to go back and ask a different question of where do you think immersion cooling will have an advantage by 2030? I think the edge market is certainly one that uh, that springs to mind for me. Uh, I have either, either very few or almost no moving parts. So from, from that perspective, maintenance becomes a lot less, um, a, 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 a much less of a requirement. And also there's just frankly less to break. So, so in that context, I think Matt has a very good point. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, well, that already is the case indeed. So especially when uh, with the rollout of 5G, the data processing uh, drastically increasing, uh, that means compute has to get further into the edge, uh, which is usually not equipped to deal with, facilit uh, with uh, core data center facility requirements, right? So you don't set up a whole data center in the edge to deal with 100 kilowatt or 200 kilowatt. Uh, that becomes very cost ineffective. Um, and that's where immersion is indeed uh, going to be uh, deployed, uh, is already being deployed. Uh, other cooling technologies are as well, other liquid cooling technologies are, but it's not just there. So whatever is being done in the edge is also being done in the core data centers, especially when it comes to these higher density environments. And uh, uh, and um, working with the latest technologies. Like I said, it's it's the standard IT equipment, it's the mainstream IT equipment that is now becoming more and more an issue, right? So uh, right now, current CPU specs are going up to 300, kilo, uh, 300 watts uh, per CPU. Next generation is going to double it again, uh, almost going to double it. I mean, that that's something you can't avoid in your core facility. It's just, it's just, it's just going to be avoided. So that's a, that's a very good point there, Rolf. I mean, so so maybe it's 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 the fact that we have to stay within very tight boundaries. And, and you know, I, I answer this to Matt. 
Yeah, is, is the fact that we have the same very tight boundaries defined by ASHRAE, um, which, which is ultimately focusing on what the IT manufacturers are prepared to warrant against. Um, is, is the fact that we're having to stay within relatively narrow ASHRAE boundaries, you know, making life very difficult for air cooling and, and giving an opportunity to liquid cooling guys. I guess is that, that, is that a question me. to me or, um, or Matt? <laughs> Limiting our ability to use air cooling because of, of the narrow temperature range and humidity range that we have to operate within. Go ahead, Matt. <laughs> yeah. Well, anybody that knows me knows that I'm fairly um, vocal on this subject. Um, you know, <laughs> just to give them a, a lot of credit, which they do deserve, you know, actually TC 9.9 have done fantastic things uh, in shaping the, well, I wouldn't say the air cooling industry, I'd say the, the data center industry, you know, as a whole, they've, they've been fantastic and they continue um, to do great work and lots of research into it. Um, the problem with the TC 9.9 recommendations is that they are recommendations um, which people, well, people take them as gospel, but they are recommendations. When you look at the uh, ASHRAE recommended sort of uh, up to 27 supplier temperatures, you know, you've got in your A rated. The difference between recommended and A rated is recommended was a consensus that was, yeah, that'll be fine. And the A rated is actually driven by manufacturers. So when you buy a server these days, it's typically A4 rated um, for 100% of the time, or at least, you know, 40 degrees, 100% of the time, up to 45 for, you know, 75% power for 20 hours of the year or whatever it is. Um, because of that, people generally see them as opposites. So the A rated is almost seen as a, um, oh, you're risking it a little bit, um, which isn't actually the case. So I think to answer your question, Mark, I think, yes, ASHRAE TC 9.9 has somewhat stagnated the industry. Uh, and it's only really the hyperscalers that have complete control of their facilities and their kit, uh, and arguably their kit refresh, which is something that people will will bring on to in terms of critical X factors and, and things like that. But um, you know, the large colour environments are very much governed by SLA, which is driven by ASHRAE recommended supplier temperatures. So it becomes a, a, a very difficult challenge for, for companies uh, like Airedale to, to keep sort of taking, you know, that last tiny little bit of, of a step forward in, in terms of increasing the efficiency because you're working with you know, very, very tight margins, um, like closing those approaches from three degrees to two and a half degrees and things like that. You know, that costs a lot of money um, for, you know, not much appreciable gain. And we're starting to get closer now to the point where uh, unless uh, operating temperatures and, and general consensus changes, it's going to flatline. You know, as PUE, as PUE and uh, data center efficiency flatlines, it, it will actually start to creep back up, I think, because CapEx will begin um, to, to bear more of a burden and people will just be, you know, they'd just rather run their stuff uh, at worse PUE and, and, and spend less on it. A lot of that, you know, the, the, the temperature ranges and the humidity ranges are driven by equipment warranty rather than energy efficiency. So, um, you know, and I think uh, ASHRAE do turn to off a lot of reasons for not going into um, you know, those boundary conditions. So uh, there, there, there is an inhibiting factor. I totally agree with you. So we, we, we're getting to the point where we, we should start thinking about asking some questions. But um, before we do that, we, we've actually been running a survey over the, um, the, the the last couple of weeks or so, and I just probably like to give you the um, the results of that survey. So we asked the question: When will emerging cooling overtake air cooling in large data centres? Back to the original motion. Um, interestingly, um, only five percent of people thought it would be by 2025. Something like 18 percent of people said by 2030. Um, 18 percent of people also said by 2035. Uh, and then later than 2035 was actually 36 percent um we even got some people 23 percent of people saying never so um rolf I, I, i'd like to throw that at you and see what your response to that survey is Oh, I actually don't don't disagree with the numbers there. Uh, I I think this this division in numbers is actually uh, uh, potentially even representative for how uh, for the percentage of the industry that will actually migrate to immersion in over these periods of time. So, considering the fact that the industry is immensely big, uh, huge, uh, the uh, by twenty twenty five, I think that liquid cooling is going to be predominantly present. Uh, originally, th this poll was about liquid cooling, not necessarily immersion cooling. So uh, were the question formulated as liquid cooling, I would say uh, that this would be conservative. But 
uh, when it comes to immersion cooling, yeah, the, the footprint of immersion over the next five years, I think that will focus on uh, on edge, on hyperscale, uh, but it will probably follow that percentage over that period of time. Uh, and I think five percent of an entire of the entire data center industry being migrated to immersion, I think that's good. <laughs> I, I know it's not justified to use these percentages in that way. I'm twisting uh, the poll here, but the, I, I think that it feels about ballpark and uh get into about 20 percent by 2030 uh, i think that's where you where you reach a level of uh efficiency uh industry wide uh, so if you look at 10 years ago what what were cpus doing at the time uh, and what is now still the biggest footprint inside data centers we're still we're still talking about the power footprint of that chips had 10 years ago uh, so a supercomputer that was built 10 years ago uh, that is that sort of equipment is something you still find in data centers being present today as mainstream equipment uh, so it follows the formula one uh, type stuff where formula one is great it's got the latest technologies and it takes a couple of years before it trickles down into the main uh, consumer market right so i think i think this will follow the same trend here uh, but yeah, no, I, I don't disagree with this when it comes to immersion cooling. Like I said before, immersion cooling is part of an ecosystem of liquid technologies. And it's a, uh, if the question was formulated as will liquid cooling overtake air cooling, <clears throat> I think that will be very, very soon. Uh, uh, because that's part of, the, uh, part of the movement that is now starting uh, across the world uh, when it comes to overall efficiency, uh, there will be a mix of radar coolers, cold plate, and immersion being deployed over the next years. And it will start with radar coolers. Uh, and it's uh, so that's already has been going on for the last couple of years. Cold plate is now penetrating. Immersion is following the tracks now of cold plate. And it's not a matter of which is better than the other. Now, these platforms all solve different types of challenges. And eventually, all the challenges can be tackled with every, with a combination of these liquid technologies. I'm going to just, um, Matt, sort of turn to you on, on maybe a final question before we go into the Q&A session itself. So fr from what I'm hearing, if I, if I try to sort of distill this down a little bit, I, I, I'm getting the sense actually there's, there's quite a, a higher degree of consensus here than, than I might have imagined in the sense that um, I, I think there's, there's room for both technologies, and actually there's, there's room not for both technologies, but actually for quite a high degree of collaboration between both technologies and, and, and even interdependence. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you look at the poll question, um, ignoring the sort of like, when will it overtake? You know, you're going to see a far larger increase uh, in hybrid scenarios over the next five to 10 years. That's for sure. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, it, it's not all about what's, you know, one is better than the other. As Rob said, there, there are circumstances and use cases where certain uh, solutions will be better than others. You know, uh, we wouldn't be good engineers uh, if we were just trying to, you know, shoe on the same thing into every single solution. That's, that's not how we work as an industry. That's not how we've gained so much traction in terms of reducing our carbon footprint and, and you know, increasing energy efficiencies. Um, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is that you know, you look at a company like Airdale that has, you know, we have done loads and loads of innovation uh, and, and done lots of different products and sell lots of different products into the data center air cooling market. But we also do that one thing that the immersion and the liquid cooling stuff needs as well, which is heat rejection. You know, typically we do chillers, but we also do dry coolers, adiabatic dry coolers, all that sort of stuff. And there is a, obviously a synergy in that because no matter what you're doing, however you're capturing that heat, however you're rejecting it, it is typically done uh, unless you've got some very exotic use cases through uh, an external piece of you know, cooling hardware. So, you know, the, the, we, we both have this sort of symbiosis that neither one of us can, in the future at least, can actually exist without the other. So I think, uh, you know, overall, immersion cooling, liquid cooling, Airdale are already getting involved in all of these aspects. So what you're actually seeing is that they we're not really that far apart it's just that the industry is changing and we're slowly sort of coming together to give a better overall picture to the industry rather than trying to fight off there's enough work for everybody yeah. absolutely correct so uh, I, I can speak for myself here as well when i say 
that uh, our technology is completely and utterly useless if there is not a rejection system uh, out there that can take on that heat and convert that back into cooling, right? So that, that there, is, there is a symbiotic relationship that needs to exist there. Uh, if only you get into heat pumps, then we can also solve that, uh, the, the reuse aspects and make sure that it's, uh, the data centers are actually really becoming carbon neutral uh, because that's what it's going to take. And, uh, uh, and and that's a much better solution than actively cooling equipment. But I think uh, Airdale is a company that is set up for dealing with that kind of challenge. So that I think uh, I, I'd love to see that uh, in in next stages in the industry and how these kind of relationships start forming instead of considering each other competitors, um, as in air cooling being competitive to liquid cooling. I think these two have to go together and have to join forces to uh, to really solve uh, the holistic challenges of the industry. I mean, dis disappointing from from the perspective of you know we wanted to fight, but actually um, you know, that you guys are actually far more in sync than maybe you know most of us might have appreciated, and we're we're disappointed we didn't get the fight. So. Um, <laughs> So, well, what, what, well, a bit. Yeah, a little bit. I'm going to do another five minutes of Q&A. We've got quite a few questions coming in, actually. And, and I, I apologise that we won't be able to answer them all. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is, is just pick up on a few and, and ask you both the questions. But if you can make your answers brief, please, because um, if we keep the answers brief, we might better get through a few more questions. So the first one I'm going to go to is... Um, on the legacy side, uh, would immersion cooling be suitable for in older data centers where we've got a slab loading of less than 10 kilonewtons? So, um, so Rolf, how, how does that work? You, you know, again, for the legacy perspective. I didn't really get the full question, sorry. Sites. Uh, how does the immersion cooling work in sites where we've got a relatively um, low ability to uh, to carry weight in in the data sector, so something less than ten kilo, kilo newtons, for instance. Right. So let let me tell you. I'll try and be very brief in this anecdote. Uh, I think it was last year at the data center members that Meta, Meta and I spoke as well. Um, uh, on one of the mornings of the data center dynamics show, I uh, had a conversation with somebody and he said, he told me about, well, you know what, these liquid cooling technologies, uh, it's all nice and well, but you know what, I can't get them into my white space. They're way too heavy and they're way too difficult to deal with and you can't deploy it anywhere. Um, which was a very interesting statement at the time because, um, uh, and I asked him, well, have you ever seen an event like this in a historical building with live IT equipment? He said, no, no, of course not. That's not possible. I said, well, have a look around. Because at that point in time, in that event, in that historical building in the center of London, there were three liquid technologies deployed with active server environments as operational data centers on a wooden floor inside a historical building, fully uh, commissioned with liquid and, and IT equipment being live. And that's when this person in question said, oh, shit, yeah, now I get it, right? So um, these type of things are, not, are usually not even a problem. If you look at a fully loaded rack with air-cooled equipment, the actual weight difference is not that massive and the rare occasions where they are a challenge, I mean, we don't even need the whole white space. The white space today has been designed for air cooling. We can be in the garage if you like. Uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be in that same area if that is a challenge. But so far, honestly, I haven't really seen the real scenarios where our solutions do not fit on a floor because of weight limitations. I, I just haven't seen it. Okay, fair enough. That's a good one. Um, in, in the interest of speed, I'm moving through some of these questions. Uh, to you, Matt, do you have um, maybe a comparison between the TCO, total cost of ownership, um, between liquid and uh, liquid immersion uh, versus air cooling over, let's say, a 10-year period? Um, you, you know, 
is, is it worth looking at it sort of you know per kilowatt of IT load or something of that nature? Would, would that be a useful thing to have? And, and does anybody have it? Um. I guess that the problem with that stuff is you can actually start off as almost like how long is a piece of string because there's so many different variables to that puzzle. But um, it's definitely something that if you were comparing two designs, you could certainly do it. Um, I have to admit, I haven't done it to that level um, of, of complexity, if you like, and, and taking everything into account. But no, I, I agree. That's probably an interesting one that maybe Rolf and I can, um, can work together on and just kind of you know show where the um, the current crossover is in terms of where that that efficiency difference comes um, and where it starts to, to benefit in your long-term TCO. Yeah, it might be a useful thing to do. Um, Rolf, you still sort of question, Rolf, again, uh, if we can sort of keep it relatively brief so we can get through a few. Um, what about speed of deployment, uh, immersion versus liquid, uh, sorry, uh, versus air? Um, any, any sort of comparative metrics there? Yeah, plenty, but uh, here's, here's the, so I, I don't like, spreading marketing stuff without backing it up with real data and there's that's where the problem lies uh, there are not many liquid cooling installations that have been operated for 10 years non-stop uh, there's a, there's only a, a handful we're talking about usually supercomputers and and that information is not not always readily available and also based on a level of technology that is that dates 10 years back now if you look at the technologies that are out there today uh, and and asperitas included of course um, especially in our case, that there's, there's zero moving parts. So the OPEX uh, element is is a is a big uh, upside for us. Uh, we also don't have pumps uh, which we need to power. So there is a, there is a level of efficiency that so far uh, is, is really uh, impressive. But we lack the long term data to back it up to back up the claim. So all we have is uh, uh, the last couple of years of deployment and uh, that doesn't really uh, really warrant a good case based on 10 years. We've got a question in about PUE, uh, air cool versus emotion cooling. Um, and, and the comment is that uh, carbon footprint is a decision driver. Well, carbon footprint doesn't have anything to do with DCP, PUE. So, um, I, I, I'm not sure how that really works. You know, PUE is obviously about energy usage and not about the, the ultimate carbon footprint. It doesn't um, determine the kind of energy you're using. But that might be a useful thing to look at. PUE doesn't have that. nothing to do with it. Um, what else have we got in here? Um, we've got, a, we've got uh, somebody saying, Enrico here, saying that uh, I agree, a collaboration and mixing the, te the different technologies is probably the best solution. So. Again, we, we've avoided the fight. We've got, you know, a bit of a love-in between the two camps now. Um, so it would appear that that probably is the right way forward. <laughs> we've got a question for, for Rolf here. Um, based on 1% um, of power being currently used in data centers, the estimate being 10% by 2025, um, how scalable and deployable is it been calling for the market, considering there's a large number of manufacturers that are having air-cooled solutions? Are there enough um, cooling, liquid cooling manufacturers out there to support the need? And I guess you're, you're going to say, yes, we'll grow to support the need. <laughs> well, you know we're better than that, uh, Mark. Uh, so, yeah, never, never any bullshit from my end. Uh, at least that's what I'm trying. Um, forgive my French there. Uh, for a second, uh, almost forgot we're in uh, we're in a live session here. Uh, but yeah, no, uh, that, that's, that's it's a very good question actually. Uh, and yes, that is uh, one of the concerns. But this is also why uh, the larger uh, data center uh, uh, companies are uh, now strategically aligning with virtually every liquid cooling technology out there. Right, so. Um, Right, I, I don't think there is any liquid cooling vendor that is not scaling up at this point in time. Uh, everybody is scaling up, and that scaling will not stop until 10 years from now. So that will continuously scale. The business is increasing, the market is increasing, and that is uh, so. Yeah, that's going to be ramped up. Uh, although I'd also want to respond to the percentages mentioned. There is a, a whole bunch of percentages that is being called out across the world 3%, 8%, 20%, even. Uh, one of the problems is that nobody knows what the real percentages are, and uh, I think that's something that needs to be 
addressed at some point as well, but probably not here. Actually, I, I don't think anybody knows what the true consumption levels are at the moment, never mind what they'll be in five or ten years' time. Um, some of the estimates I've seen actually result in us using more power in the whole centre industry than we actually produce across the world. So, um, yeah, there, there's some very strange numbers, actually, which I think we do need to be looked at fairly carefully. Um, I, I totally agree. So we are... We're nearly at 10 past. We started about 11 or 12 minutes past. So I'm just going to give each of you a chance for a final word um, before we actually close the session down. Uh, we'll have done just about the hour. So I'm going to go to you first, Matt. Um, final comments. You know, now, now that we've got this mutual love in and that you're both best of friends, um, oh. final comments to answer the session. I was saving my big blows and for, for that moment, and you've just shot it down. <laughs> um. No, I've enjoyed it. It's nice speaking to Rolf. I uh, just wish you know, it had been in person uh, in our usual uh, environment, which most people will know what that is. Um, no, it's been, it's been fun. Um, you know, I'm, I'm as, as people probably know, very interested in all sorts of um, different aspects of the data center industry, particularly cooling and exotic cooling and keeping up to, uh, to speed with it and, and getting involved. Um, one thing I, that I think is, um, is really commendable in terms of what the uh, what Rolf is doing in terms of the immersion side is the OCP environment, um, and that is something that um, Airedale is you know getting involved in as well. And I thought Rolf was going to start giving all our secrets away in terms of people ramping up to all this new ventures. Um, you know, we we're trying to stay very current, and uh, I think if you pay uh, pay attention to what will happen in the next uh, you know probably six to twelve months, I think people will be quite surprised in uh, in what will what will be going on. Right, so I'm going to be very curious about that. Um, <laughs> so I'll pick your brain after this session uh, on that one. But uh, yeah, no, absolutely, I I, I agree. Um, uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff happening. OCP is a, is in the a centralized platform that is facilitating that, uh, and that is currently driving a lot of this momentum for change in the industry. Uh, looking forward to. Uh, doing a lot more with Airbill, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that I'll be able to uh, uh, that, that that you'll allow us to to help you get into the new scene as well. Uh, that, that that's a play that we're uh, uh, ready to ready to play. As long as you buy the drinks, mate, we're all good. That's deal. <laughs> well, let's, let's, not, let's not force the time where we can actually meet up and have a drink. I think that's Absolutely. what we're doing. <laughs> So I think it just leaves it to me to, to wrap the session up. Um, I, I thank you very much, both of you. Thanks to Matt, thanks to Rolf, thanks to Asperitas, and thanks to Airdale for firstly, you know, being prepared to have this debate online, being prepared to actually, you know, put, put yourselves in a position to, uh, to be challenged uh, and challenge. Um, interesting that we, we, we didn't necessarily have the, uh, the cooperative approach that we expected, but uh, I think actually having a consensus is even better. Um, so again, thank you to, to Rolf, thanks to Matt, and, um, and thank you very much to both Airedale and Asperitas for having the, uh, uh, the confidence and, and, and the, um, the willingness to actually take part in this. And so thank you very much, and, and apologies to everybody for the technical problems, which were largely of my making, I think. So again, thank you, everybody. No, thanks very much for everybody that's come to see us as well. And thank thanks very much to you, Mark, and uh, also to uh, Darren and Amelia behind the scenes for sorting this out. Thanks very much. Absolutely. All right, cool. Cheers, Rolf. Cheers, Mark. Cheers. See you soon. Bye-bye.